my gosh. <laughs> A decade ago, all of our efforts were designed to basically preserve what still remains. What we've now experienced is what these injuries look like a decade after those interventions, right? And some of those interventions have worked beautifully, but some of those haven't stood up to the test of time. And there's no better spokesperson than someone who has lived what we could provide a decade ago and has now experienced what we're able to provide now and then can speak to that difference. psychological operations team leader. What I did, I would go pretty much where nobody else would go. A lot of the villages, a lot of the small town centers out in the middle of the desert and just talk to people. I would do my best to meet their needs. You would be amazed at what you can accomplish when you treat people like people. I didn't care where they're from, who they prayed to, and over time they just provided information for our own good and for their own. Uh, so basically, I achieved great things because I treated people with respect and kindness, and uh, that was not too highly looked upon by the insurgency. The attack was on October 29th in 2005, and typically speaking with my team, I had a small team, uh, we had three Humvees. All right, load up. All right, everybody. But there was a division order that came down from the division. Instead of my three vehicles, we were going to go out with the battalion. So instead of three vehicles, I was the 27th vehicle in a 69 vehicle convoy. And they waited for me. There were eight insurgents that day. And three of the eight had photos of me and my vehicle on them. In the PSYOP vehicle, I had a large loudspeaker on the top. And I had a poster on the side of the vehicle with my phone number on it because I used to give out business cards. Uh, so if people wanted to get in touch with me, they could. So my vehicle is pretty easy to identify. My vehicle rolled over the ID. They triggered it. They basically evaporated the rear half of my vehicle. Come on, sir. Come on, sir. I sat in the front right passenger seat. The gentleman sat behind me was the battalion uh, intelligence officer and uh, he was thrown from the vehicle. Any pulse, Fort Jacob? No. Nothing? Nothing. Nothing. And there was very little damage to him at all. You see a little blood running out of his nose and that was about it. But his brain had ruptured from the percussion of the blast and he died instantly. Okay. Be okay. The gentleman that was sitting behind my driver was one of my security detachment. He was my roommate. Uh, he took the brunt of the blast. Uh, they had problems finding parts of him. They had, couldn't get him out of the vehicle. Sergeant. Yeah. You all right? I don't know. All right. All right. Hold still, okay? Yeah. All right. You're all right, okay? Okay. Your head hurts? Okay. I'm going to see it in the second okay? okay? Oh, my Don't. Lord. You're going to be all right. Oh, my God. I'm going to have some more pain. I was shot once in the right shoulder and three times in the right leg. How bad am I? Don't worry about it. You're all right. You're going on. My stomach hurts. Your stomach hurts? The percussion from the blast pressed my breastplate from my body armor into my stomach, which ruptured my stomach, and I lost a, a quarter of my stomach and a third of my small intestines. <laughs> and and uh, I fractured my spine between L4 and L5 in three places. You know, so it wasn't one of my better days.
I uh, spent uh, 22 months at the hospital in Fort Sam Houston in Texas. And while there, I underwent, I, I don't know how many searches, you know, maybe 40-ish. Psychologically, the hardest thing for me is not the physical injuries, but uh, the loss of memory and the loss of two close friends by far outweighed the physical injuries. Survivor's guilt. Survivor's guilt has always been one of the hardest things for me to deal with. I think the physical aspect of everything that he deals with, sometimes he doesn't have a chance to get to that mental aspect or to even think about it or feel sorry for himself about how he looks. But when we met, he wouldn't even go out to the, so you say that, he wouldn't even go out to the mailbox without his ears. <laughs> I had prosthetic ears that were magnetic. Yeah. I worried a lot about how I, my appearance affected other people because, and she's been with me, we'll be walking through the mall, mothers or will take their children and grab them and pull them out of my way. Uh, and I kind of get it, you know, it doesn't hurt my feelings. I used to in the beginning, it used to hurt my feelings. That's when I decided, you know, I just to take it, you know, because I'd had, I don't know, maybe a dozen surgeries over the years, the previous 15 years trying to salvage a hand that really wasn't a lot of good other than causing pain. Amputees have become viewed less so as oddities or kind of anomalies and more so they, you can see a, a greater presence in the mainstream. At the same time, I think there's been renewed surgical interest in amputation. In a conventional amputation, you're removing part of the limb and then the tissues that are left over are just sutured to the end of the bone or to each other to keep them stable. So what you've done is just anchored them uh, in, an, in an effort to just provide padding, but you've, you've lost a relationship that the brain is used to perceiving, right? So when you talk about proprioception, proprioception is basically a sense of where you are in space. You get that sense largely from basically stretch receptors that are built into the muscles. And so combining visual feedback with a sense of kind of which muscles are stretched and how much are they stretched gives the brain a sense of where that limb is in space. Well, with a conventional amputation that aims just to accomplish coverage, you've gotten rid of that relationship. And so what this procedure aims to do is provide a construct so that when a flexor muscle contracts, it's stretching an extensor muscle, or when an extensor muscle contracts, it's stretching a flexor muscle, and you provide a surgical strategy where you can maintain a little bit of that motion, and you're restoring that feedback to the brain. In Jerry's hand, you had a hand that was not providing him the function he needed. He seemed to have the wrist anatomy we needed, the existing pain and uh, lack of function that made the proposition of converting to an amputation reasonable, and then had the personality and willingness to kind of take that leap with us. Well, they were telling me after the amputation there's gonna be all this pain and I might need this medication and that medication. The next day I was telling them I, I feel better than I did before the surgery, so I, I'm good. I'm not watching, I can't see. Got it? I'm gonna take your hand off, okay? So, go ahead and just give me a close. Nice. Okay. Give me an open. It's nice and easy. Nice. I think uh, because of the, the surgery, we have more defined motions. So we've trained one as a, a two pinch grip. Let's see if we can, that's, that's the one, that's okay. So try two, okay, we, can re, we can retrain those a little bit. There you go, there's your two, open. I have to teach myself how to use the muscles because like I was trying to close the, do the tripod for them like that. And I was confusing the hand because it's similar to closing fist-wise. Then I realized, okay, that's more like the palm. 
so I'm feeling, even though it's not there, I try to visualize closing the palm, and that's how I can get it to close. I can feel my pinky, my middle finger, my pointer, and my thumb, and you can see them moving on my skin, and they feel in the same place like they're supposed to be. There's going to be some obstacles, I'm pretty sure of it, but I think that, you know, overall, it's successful when he's not in pain all the time. Being the first was exciting to me, but it wasn't necessarily for me, and it's still not for me, because I, if it's going to help the next troops to come through with this new surgery, if you can learn from me, do it.